Hi guys, and welcome to the third lecture for chapter 12. So we've already talked about freshwater ecosystems as well as oceans and marine ecosystems. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about water uses as well, and specifically human uses and how they apply to us and some of the problems with human uses. So uh, when we think about uh, consumptive uses of water, it's useful to have a definition. Consumptive use is basically water that is removed from an aquifer or a surface water body and is not returned. So these are where we actually consume the water. It's going to be used for things like irrigation, where we are removing water and using it to water our plants, for drinking water, and for a number of variety, for a variety of different uses where we do not actually put the water back. Now, 70% of our uh, water water is used for agriculture. And this is by far and away the greatest use of any fresh water. Basically, irrigation is by far and away the greatest use, uh, consumptive use of water. Now, 20% is for industry. There are a lot of industrial uses for water, as well as 10% is for residential use. That's going to be drinking water, as well as the water that we use to irrigate our lawns. It's going to be separate for water that we use to irrigate uh, agriculture. Now, uh, there are also something called non-consumptive uses of water. Non-consumptive uses of water are where we take water from a water body, we use it, and then we actually put it back. It doesn't actually permanently remove that uh, water from the water body. So examples of this are electricity generation for hydroelectric power plants, uh, cooling uses. Basically, we use water as a way to cool off nuclear power plants and some other uh, coal power plants. And then shipping. Shipping, we are actually using water as the medium for which we actually transport goods and services. Now, human activities affect waterways and human activities affect water bodies. Now, water is a limited but renewable resource. Remember, this is an exhaustible renewable resource that we talked about going back to chapter one. So as long as we use it sustainably, we have uh, water that we can freely use and exploit. However, we have some serious issues with water usage. Essentially, people are withdrawing water from uh, aquifers and uh, different surface water reservoirs at unsustainable rates. And one third of uh, the world's people are affected by shortages. Yemen, um, before the huge Yemeni crisis that is a huge political crisis at the moment, Yemen was actually in 2009 the first country that actually completely ran out of water from, from their aquifers. So this is a problem that we are going to be confronted with increasingly in the next 10, 20, 15 years as we, uh, as we are continuing to exhaust our uh, fossil water reservoirs. That's going to be going back to our aquifer. People also engineer waterways. So there are dams, levees, uh, diversion canals. And in addition to this, they use these different uh, forms of uh, waterways to for supplies. They use it for transportation. And they also use it as a mechanism for flood control. A lot of uh, coastal water bodies, the so coastal estuaries, lakes, and other areas are actually artificially open sometimes as a means to let water out so it doesn't flood surrounding areas, normally suburban populations. And so what we do uh, and how we share these water bodies have uh, very important implications for how the resulting ecosystems function as well as how the water cycles and how it has resounding impacts and very far-reaching impacts in uh, different locations that are not immediately or directly associated with the areas that we're actually altering. And we're going to explore that in a few minutes here. So before we go into anything else, it's useful to talk about agriculture in and of itself just because it is a huge source of uh, consumptive water use. Basically, rapid population growth requires uh, more food and it requires more clothes. And so we are using 70% more irrigation than we did even 15 years ago. By the way, fun fact, a lot of your clothes come from cotton, linen, and different plant-based products. So when we're irrigating, we're not just irrigating for necessarily the foods you eat, we're also irrigating for the clothes that you're going to be wearing. And irrigation can double crop yields. We went into all the benefit or some of the benefits of irrigation when we were talking about uh, our agriculture culture and our soils chapter, chapter seven. Eighteen percent of land is irrigated but produces forty percent of our crops. If we're thinking back, this is going to refer to that intensification that we had talked about back in chapter uh, in chapter uh, seven. But we also talked in chapter seven that irrigation was highly inefficient. Remember that only about forty percent of the water that we use to irrigate actually makes it into our uh, crops. Basically, water just evaporates right off the leaves as we are irrigating. So most of the water in that picture off to the right here is not going to go into the ground. It's just going to evaporate straight back into the, uh, into the air. 
And in addition to this, 15 to 35 percent of uh, agriculture which uses irrigation is unsustainable. We are typically going to be growing uh, plants in areas where those uh, environments were not ever made or were not ever shaped to support those plants. So, for example, cotton is grown in Arizona for whatever reason. It, cotton is one of the most water intensive crops on the planet, and yet it is grown in a literal desert. This, this mismatch between where crops are grown and what climates can support them offer a huge huge unsustainable suck on our uh, water sources, specifically for irrigation. And this is going back to what I referred to as fossil water in the, uh, the previous slide. Basically, we are mining water. <laughs> We're going to go into it in just a second, but uh, those aquifers that we talked about in the previous lectures, they take years and years to recharge. So when we are withdrawing water faster than it is replaced, it is referred to as water mining because the water that we are getting is fossil water. It is essentially, in this sense, it is so uh, slow to recharge that it is, it is essentially a non-renewable resource. And this is a huge problem because once we run out of water, we are going to have to come up with some very innovative and very expensive ways to solve this crisis. So going back to that uh, groundwater withdrawal, specifically with the within the context of uh, over-irrigation, the Ogallala Aquifer is one of the major crisis points, uh, specifically because of how much water it supplies to the uh, Midwest. Basically, the Ogallala Aquifer, or the High Plains Aquifer, is the world's largest known aquifer. It is massive, and it encompasses a huge part of the Midwest. So over here on your uh, right-hand side of the screen, you can see that it... Uh, at a cursory glance, has at least nine states that this aquifer encompasses. The majority of it is actually in uh, Nebraska. Now, it is it underlines the Great Plains of the uh, the U.S. and it has allowed farmers to create the most bountiful uh, grain producing region in the world. Remember that the Midwest is considered the breadbasket of the United States. However, the problem here is that you are growing uh, grains, a very water intensive crop, in a place that doesn't actually see a lot of rainfall. After after the mid region of the United States, water uh, precipitation kind of falls off a cliff. There is almost no precipitation as you move further and further west into the Rocky Mountains, and then all of a sudden you get higher rates of uh, precipitation over in California on the western side of the Rocky Mountains. But in between the uh, the, the Rocky Mountains and the Midwest, there's almost no uh, precipitation, and so basically all the water that farmers are using to irrigate this area is going to be coming from the Ogallala Aquifer and we are draining it at incredibly fast rates. Remember that aquifers take a very long time to charge. Because of those uh, clay boundaries that we talked about in lecture one, it, they only recharge in certain places known as recharge points. So it takes a very long time for water to get into the aquifer, and it, we can suck it dry very, very quickly. The Ogallala Aquifer, for example, is being has a rate of recharge at around 9 billion gallons of water a year, which is a lot but we're depleting it at a rate of 90 billion gallons a year, which is 10 times the rate of recharge. And that number is only increasing as we are continuing to grow more and more farms and we are continuing to use incredibly unsustainable practices. So this gives you an idea of why people call this fossil water. This water is not going to be ever recharged fast enough for us to sustainably use it, especially at the unsustainable and insufficient or inefficient uses that we are currently uh, using to irrigate our crops. It is uh, it is becoming a major problem, and the moment that we run out of water in the uh, the High Plains Aquifer, the Ogallala Aquifer, we are going to have some serious economic problems because all of a sudden we are going to lose all of our bread growing farms, and we are going to use a hu lose a huge economic uh, source of economic income for that entire region of the United States. It's a huge problem, and it branches beyond just environmental issues to actually the economics, a major major economic increase influence uh, for the entire United States of America. So there are some additional issues with uh, groundwater withdrawal. Remember how we talked about, this was actually our example when we talked about ecosystem services, that when we withdraw groundwater too quickly, it actually has some serious issues with uh, the collapse of uh, land surface. So basically we have land subsidence where the land actually begins to uh, lower, and this can have some really uh, serious issues for uh, infrastructure, but it can also have some serious issues when uh, groundwater is uh, happening, withdrawal 
withdrawal is happening so rapidly that we are actually causing uh, the actual collapse of uh, land surfaces. And this is where we have sinkholes. Sinkholes are actually a huge issue in uh, in the peninsula of Florida, where we are in some cases withdrawing uh, withdrawing groundwater so rapidly that all of a sudden the water that was actually helping support the limestone above it, when that is completely drained, it can collapse and have huge implications if there's anyone on top of that land, whenever it collapses, they can die. It can have huge issues with uh, uh, infrastructure whenever roads get completely destroyed, houses get swallowed. It can be a serious, serious issue. And in addition to that, we also talked about in uh, the first chapter something called saltwater intrusion. And this is a particular problem in Miami and some of the coastal areas. Essentially, what happens is that as you are withdrawing too much groundwater, the uh, groundwater discharge actually can no longer push saltwater out of its uh, semi-permeable membranes, that limestone. And all of a sudden, you're having saltwater actually come in and uh, contaminate the aquifer. When the uh, As the fresh water gets depleted, so that negative pressure that uh, is keeping the salt water out actually uh, is reduced. And so salt water is able to push itself back in. And then we have uh, issues with rust whenever we are like having, um, when we're looking at our piping. So we get a lot of corrosion issues and uh, we actually can't drink that water because it has so many salt ions and other different uh, contaminants that are associated with seawater. And so there are some issue or there are some solutions to groundwater groundwater withdrawal. The first is to reduce the demand, and uh, this is primarily going to be coming from agriculture. It's not that we're necessarily drinking too much, although we are probably pretty inefficient when it comes to our residential use of water. Agriculture is uh, by far the um, the major offender when it comes to groundwater withdrawal and uh, unsustainable use of water. So using uh, improving irrigation, such as drip irrigation, something again that we talked about in uh, chapter seven, basically to improve irrigation to make it more efficient. It is cheaper for the actual farmers to actually use these uh, sustainable irrigation methods because it's cheaper to use less water. Uh, matching crops with climate is a huge uh, solution. So basically don't grow really water demanding crops in areas that don't receive a lot of rainfall, i.e. Don't grow cotton in Arizona, please. Um, and then finally, using selective breeding in GMOs. I know a lot of people have some misconceptions to whether GMOs are dangerous or not. The cat's out of the bag. We've been using GMOs for uh, decades. And when we think about it, we've been using genetically modified organisms from a conventional sense for millennia. Um, GMOs aren't bad, not from a health standpoint anyway. Um, and so by using, uh, by engineering crops that are able to basically subsist off less and less water, we need to irrigate less. And so it's also an indirect way of reducing demand. Uh, looking at the residential side of things, again, residential uh, con use of consumptive water is only about 10%. So it's not the biggest offender by far and away, but by using low flow toilets, for example, so not as much uh, water in your toilet bowl. And this has actually happened uh, through time. So toilet bowl used to uh, refill at a rate of like two gallons uh, per flush, which is staggering. And now it's gone down to about almost a gallon. And in some cases, if you have a really, really high efficiency toilet, like a half gallon of water to fill that bowl. Um, low flow top faucets, low flow shower heads, uh, washing machines that take less water, uh, water that uh, watering your lawn at dawn so it doesn't evaporate in the uh, the high heat of the midday. All of these are play are opportunities to reduce water demand and save you some money. Uh, in addition, something called xeroscaping, which essentially is matching your lawn plants to the climate. So instead of using um, like Bermuda grass or St. Augustine grass for your lawn, very water intensive crops or very water intensive uh, plants for your lawn, instead use xeroscaping. So use uh, native vegetation. There are a lot of very pretty, very aesthetically pleasing uh, plants, especially in Florida, that you can plant instead of these really water demanding crops or these water demanding grasses. And uh, as a result, you can save yourself a lot of money by almost never having to water. Essentially, these plants are adapted to the climate, so they're already used to the rainfall that they naturally receive. And you can just save a boatload of money just never having to irrigate and never having to water your lawn. Finally, industry um, to recycle wastewater. Because typically industry uses of water are not going to rely on the purity of water. Normally it's a cooling mechanism. And so by recycling wastewater, fixing leaky pipes and uh, retrofitting combs with better plumbing, these are all different ways to uh, save money and save water from the industry perspective.
So going a little further into groundwater pollution, this is going to be slightly different from uh, water pollution, the water pollution lecture that we're going to talk about in our next lecture. Groundwater pollutants are a little bit different because the sources are very different from some of the other forms of uh, pollution that we're going to be talking about. Basically, the major pollutants to groundwater are fertilizers from industrial fields as well as wastewater. And this is going to come in the form of something called nitrates. We've talked ni about nitrates a lot in the form of uh, uh, anthropogenic eutrophication, so basically human-induced eutrophication or nutrient uh, supplementation of water bodies and how that can throw water bodies out of whack. Uh, groundwater pollution is also a really big issue from uh, a nitrate perspective because nitrates cause cancer. So uh, whenever you uh, drink nitrates uh, over time, it is a serious carcinogen, so it's a cancer-causing substance, and uh, so we are uh, very, very, we are very uh, susceptible to cancer as we continue to drink these uh, drink these nitrates in our water supply. And so it's a huge cause for concern to see if cancer rates, especially in Florida, are going to rise in the next 20 or 30 years as a result of continuing to drink these heavy nitrates in the water supply. Um, and groundwater pollution is very hard to detect and it's very hard to address because there are so many different diffuse sources of uh, water pollution. We're going to be talking about this again in the pollution section where we're going over the differences between point source or direct source pollution versus non-point source or diffuse sources of pollution. But groundwater pollution is non-point source, so it's very diffuse and it's very hard to address because there are so many contributing problems. So uh, in addition, the contaminants, can, the contaminants can be in these areas for decades because sunlight can never break them down. Uh, water is underground, so it's nice and cool. It's got a very consistent temperature. It's almost always 70 degrees, and there's no sunlight to actually Actually break down these complex uh, chemicals. Um, so it's very cold, so lower rates of degeneration from there. And it's also low moving, uh, so there's almost no mixing. And it has very few microbes that break some of these biotic or these, these nutrient components down. So as a result, pollution in groundwater stays for a very long time until we actually pipe it up to our water supply and consume it where we can get some of the negative side effects. So some of the solutions to groundwater pollution, it looks like I didn't uh, bold all of pollution there, apologies, um, and that is going to be wastewater treatment primarily. So basically wastewater is water affected from uh, human, human activities, which is a source of biological waste. Basically uh, wastewater treatment is where whenever we uh, you know, pee or poop in the, uh, the toilet, um, it takes that wastewater, so the water that mixes with those, uh, those excrements and that feces, and it is actually treated through a physical, chemical, and uh, biological means. Normally, if you actually had a lab component to the environmental science class, like we do in uh, Northwest Florida State College over in Niceville, or at UF when I was actually taking this class, we actually got to tour a wastewater plant. So you see step by step by step all of the uh, actually really cool uh, biochemical processes that happen. Basically, tr primary treatment is where uh, it's the initial treatment of wastewater, and it's through the physical removal of all of the uh, the contaminants and the the effluent and the uh, the feces. So basically, it uh, essentially lets all of the solids settle out of suspension, and then it takes the uh, the water that still has the some of the stuff that can't fall out of the suspension, and it treats it via secondary treatment, which it has uh, microbes uh, in the water. So it has all of these different bacteria in the water, and through mixing and aeration, it actually breaks down all of the uh, the contaminants through a biological means which is super cool, very smelly when you're there, but um, if it's done right, it is, it is really cool to see because when they are done with this entire process, the water that comes out is sparkling clear. It is actually, in most cases, a higher quality water than some of the drinking water we have now. There are a lot of uh, concerns and criticisms uh, over whether, or in a lot of debate over whether we should be looking to recycle our water. So basically, after water has gone through this process to essentially take it and uh, put it back into circulation for a water supply, there are some obvious concerns uh, to this. So there are some uh, byproducts, of, for example, of medications that we pee out or we uh, poop out that can't be broken down through some of these microbes. And so we are learning uh, ways to address that. But as soon as we fix some of those uh, problems, it this might be a serious uh, solution. Singapore, for 
for example, has already been recycling its water sources for a very long time simply because they were addressing the need that they were going to run out of water. So using these primary and secondary treatment mechanisms, we essentially are deplete. We are reducing our reliance on the aquifer, at least for our residential uh, consumption of water. And it can actually be a very good way to avoid uh, getting into uh, some or consuming some of this groundwater pollution. So for the final uh, slide for this uh, lecture, we're going to be looking a little bit at dams, some of the good and some of the bad that dams do. So dams are pretty good in that they do prevent floods. They provide uh, reservoirs so we have drinking water. They also provide a lot of water for irrigation. And through hydroelectric power, they can generate a lot of electricity. So there are some serious positives to uh, dams, particularly from the hydroelectric perspective, simply because that can allow us to uh, find some alternative methods for renewable energy, and it can offset our reliance on uh, fossil fuels. However, there are some seriously uh, negative drawbacks to some of the components of dams, uh, specifically that they harm ecosystems. So when you flood an area, all of a sudden you are flooding that ecosystem and you are causing some habitat loss from the uh, terrestrial perspective, even though you are creating some habitat for the aquatic perspective. So there are some, there is some give and take there. In addition, whenever you drown a uh, submerged or a terrestrial ecosystem, you are killing off all the plants in that area. And as they decay, they actually release a lot of CO2 back into the atmosphere. So when you initially create the dam, there is a lot of uh, CO2 that is actually emitted into the atmosphere, which can be a serious problem. In addition, this can displace people. Uh, normally this is compensated whenever there there is a dam being constructed. Uh, they typically buy all of those uh, residential homes and they move people elsewhere. So it's a little bit of give and take there, but it does displace people and it is incredibly expensive to build. In addition, there are a lot of different drawbacks in terms of settle sediment suspension that falls. There is a small risk of catastrophic failure, although that happen hasn't happened in a very long time, particularly in the United States. And there are some uh, lost opportunities for fish recruitment. This has been uh, mitigated in recent times through the fish cannons or fish ladders. If you have a minute, uh, look at these online. They are hysterical and they're also really cool from an environmental perspective. Basically, they have salmon cannons where they have these cannons that will literally blast the fish over the dam so that it can continue its uh, swim northward to release its eggs. And uh, I cannot think of a cooler job than sticking fish in a cannon and shooting them over a, uh, a dam. That would just be the cool this job in the world. But anyway, uh, so this is all of the different uses of water that we can talk about. The next lecture that we're going to be talking about are going into some of the explicit forms of water pollution. So we're going to jump, follow our uh, talk conversation about groundwater pollution and jump right into the other means of ocean pollution and uh, surface water, or water body pollution. And we're going to talk about some of the serious drawbacks as well as some ways to mitigate it. But I will uh, see you guys then. Take care.